Hello, you're watching The Interview on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson today at the British Ambassador's Residence in Paris. I'm here to meet the British Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss. Foreign Secretary, thanks for being on the programme. Great to be here. Now, you are on your way back at this point from the NATO summit in Madrid, and that's where I wanted to start. Uh, the British Prime Minister at that summit pledged an additional £1 billion of military aid for Ukraine. Um, this is very generous. It's also very expensive. How long is the UK prepared to keep supporting Ukraine in this way? Well, we're in it for the long haul. And that's also true of our NATO allies and our G7 allies. And I think what we've seen this week is incredible unity. We've seen the UK pledging more military support. France has pledged more military support. The US has pledged more military support to Ukraine because we recognise that until we succeed in helping Ukraine push Russia out, we're not going to have peace and security mm. in Europe. So this isn't just about, although it's very important, helping the Ukrainians. It's also about our own peace and security. And that's why it's very important that the UK and all of our allies are contributing to that effort in Ukraine. And in terms of uh, the difference it's making in Ukraine, of course, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, always says he's very grateful for all of this support. However, as things stand, Russia still making gains in the east. They may be small, but they are gains. And Volodymyr Zelensky is continuing his calls to the west to supply greater numbers of heavy weapons, for example. Um, it, could it be time now or soon for the UK and other states in the west to make that kind of big difference rather than perhaps this grinding on for much longer? I mean, we are supplying uh, multiple launch rocket systems, for example, to Ukraine. The United States are as well. I know other countries are supplying tanks. So there are heavy weapons mm. going in to support Ukraine. And we're doing all we can uh, as the United Kingdom to put uh, the support in. And we need to continue to do that with our allies. This is vitally important. It's vitally important for European security and we're urging everybody to do what, the, what they can. Mm. As I said, it is expensive. Um, the UK has uh, been one of the most generous donors to Ukraine so far, £3.8 billion at this point. That's after just four months of war, of course. Is the UK prepared to keep spending essentially a billion pounds a month? Well, we are in it for the long haul, together with all of our allies. One of the things we do need to do is to help the Ukrainians get their economy back up and running. This is, apart from the very important issue of feeding the world, this is why it's important that we deal with the issue at Odessa uh, and other ports in Ukraine. It's also important that we get on with Ukrainian reconstruction. We have a conference next week in Lugano where we're talking about that. To enable the Ukrainians to be earning money through their exports, and enabling the, the economy to function. Because mm -hmm. it's not just the issue of funding the war, it's also about day-to-day -day spending in Ukraine as well. And you know, we are providing money as well through the World Bank and, and financial support, but we also need to help the Ukrainians get their economy back up and running as much as is possible. Uh, you mentioned about uh, that strong uh, unity among Western nations. This is something that Boris Johnson talked about in Madrid as well. He said that the invasion of Ukraine has actually made the NATO alliance stronger. It had united the West. And now this comes just a few months, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, after there was quite the diplomatic bust up between London and Paris. It was uh, related to the setup of the AUKUS military alliance with Australia, mm -hmm. the US and the UK, and, and Australia cancelling a French submarine contract. Um, I'm just wondering, you've met the French Foreign Minister here on this visit. How would you characterise relations between London and Paris right now? Have they mended? Well, the relations are positive. We've been working very closely together on Russia and Ukraine, particularly through the G7, which has been an important coordinating body with the sanctions. And the EU has been part of that as well. And it's, I think it's one of the reasons uh, that we've been effective. And before the new foreign minister, of course, I worked closely with Jean-Yves Le Drian uh, to make sure that we, uh, mm. we had those measures in place. I do want to do more to expand our relationship with France. I think there's more we can do together in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, what we're facing at the moment is authoritarian regimes uh, investing into Pacific nations. I want free democracies like France and Britain uh, to work more closely together on that issue. Uh, I think there's more we can do on energy. Mm. Uh, we already have significant French investment in the United Kingdom. 
in terms of our nuclear energy, but there's more we can do on energy security and resilience because one of the lessons from this appalling war is that Europe overall became too dependent on Russian oil and gas. So there are lots of areas of cooperation and I do want to have a positive relationship. Let's uh, move away from uh, Ukraine-related issues. I want to talk about one of the post-Brexit issues that's ongoing, Northern Ireland. Um, and I'm going to give some background for our viewers that I'm, um, I'm sure you're all probably aware that the UK government is pressing on with efforts to pass legislation that would give UK ministers uh, the powers to override parts of the post-Brexit deal uh, that make up the Northern Ireland Protocol. That's the part of the uh, Brexit deal that was agreed between the UK and the European Commission with the intent of avoiding a physical border on the island of Ireland. It does mean that Northern Ireland is effectively still inside the EU's single market for goods, while England, Scotland and Wales are outside of it. Uh, Liz Truss, uh, this week your government took the legislation a step further down the line with a vote in the Parliament. Uh, just for our international viewers, what is this legislation intended to achieve? The fundamental issue with the Northern Ireland Protocol and the way it's operating is it's undermining the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And the whole basis of peace and political stability in Northern Ireland is the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, an equal esteem for both communities in Northern Ireland, the nationalist community and the unionist community. But what we've seen, because of the friction created on the east-west trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and because the people of Northern Ireland aren't able to benefit from the same tax cuts as people in Great Britain. The unionist community in particular feel that their community has been undermined mm. and their connection with the rest of the United Kingdom has been undermined. And the result is that the political institutions in Northern Ireland aren't working. So Northern Ireland hasn't had a government since February. Mm -hmm. And the United Kingdom government needs to act to restore political stability. Now, I would rather do it through a negotiated settlement with the European Union, mm -hmm. but at present, the European Union has not agreed to change the critical issues in the protocol around customs and around tax mm -hmm. that we need to make the situation better in Northern Ireland. And I just wanted to further say that we completely respect the EU's need to protect the single market. Mm -hmm. We have put forward proposals of a green lane and a red lane that would make sure that there is proper monitoring so that goods can't be moved into the Republic of Ireland, so they stay uh, within the United Kingdom. So we want a constructive <coughs> solution. Ideally, we want a negotiated solution, but what we can't allow is the situation to drift, which has created this political instability. There's a couple of points I want to pick up on in that. Um, firstly, Boris Johnson himself said in 2019 that uh, the protocol was compliant with the Good Friday Agreement. And as things stand today, a majority of members of the Northern Ireland Assembly support the protocol. And polling shows that protocol support has grown across all communities. And there's now a majority support among Northern Irish people. Um, is the UK government, in fact, going against the will of the people in Northern Ireland? Well, first of all, we did sign the protocol but we signed it in abstract before it had been implemented. Boris Johnson negotiated and the protocol. He, he did. He co-authored it. He did. Yeah. And, um, but what we signed in abstract has not worked on the ground and it's creating very, very serious problems. Mm. And I think in that situation, it's right to seek a mm. better outcome. In terms of negotiation, you said that you are willing to talk to the European Commission. Maros Shevchovic, uh, the European Commission Vice President, who's dealing with this, said talk, talks while this legislation is going through is like negotiating with a gun on the table. I mean, we, we have been in talks for 18 months, so we tried very, very hard to get a negotiated settlement without having to pass this legislation. But those talks didn't get to the outcome mm. because of a fundamental refusal to change the text of the protocol, which is causing problems. And I just wanted to respond to your earlier point about the political situation in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. the, this is not about whether the majority agree, it's about whether we can get the support of both communities in Northern Ireland, mm. because getting the support of both communities is what is important to get the executive back up and running. So well, the so, Deputy Prime Minister of 
Ireland, Leo Varadkar, said yesterday, the Thursday, that he believes your government is in fact siding with just one community, the unionist community. Well, th that's not true, because we also want to protect north-south trade, and we absolutely believe in maintaining that part of the protocol, but we have to fix the east-west issues, because the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is based on esteem for both communities, and believe me, if there was a way of fixing this mm. that could get the support of both communities in Northern Ireland without having to take this step, we would do it. Mm. But we, we are compelled to act and it is legal for us to act because of necessity. And there is an international doctrine of necessity that if state functions are being undermined, if political stability is, un is undermined, then a government does have mm. the ability and, in my view, the duty to act in this situation. But we are doing it because of those very serious political mm. stability. And to all those who say the majority in Northern Ireland think this or X thinks Y, the fact is the political institutions haven't been working since February. It's also and, a question of international law, if I might just bring that in as well. The European Commission, very clear, they see this as a violation of international law, this legislation. Irish ministers would agree. Um, also, senior Biden administration officials expressing strong concerns this week about the legislation. How concerned are you about the UK's reputation, a country that has, for history, has stood for the rule of law, being seen as breaking international law on something so serious as this? We stand for international law, and this is lawful, because of the doctrine of necessity, because we have to act because of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement being undermined and the political stability in Northern Ireland. And none of the parties that you've just referred to have come up with an alternative way of restoring the institutions in Northern Ireland. So your government is going to continue with this approach? Yes, but we remain open to a negotiated solution uh, provided there is an acknowledgement that the text of the protocol needs to change. But we want to work with the EU. We want to sort this situation out. But what I simply cannot allow is this situation to drift. It's already drifted for 18 months. We have real unhappiness in the <coughs> unionist community in Northern Ireland. And as the UK government, political stability within our own country has and protecting the Belfast Good Friday Agreement has to be our priority. Liz Trust, that is all we have time for, but thank you very much for being with us today on France thank 24. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you for watching as well. See you soon here on France 24. Your needs are changing, and so is France24.com. With articles, reports, the latest international news, all our programmes available on replay, together with live broadcasting 24 7. Intuitive, fast, and available in four languages. France24.com. Liberté, égalité, actualité.